Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress, my bowels are troubled, my heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled, abroad the sword bereaveth, and at home there is death. They have heard that I sigh, there is none to comfort me. All mine enemies have heard of my trouble, they are glad that thou hast done it. Uh, thou wilt bring the day that thou hast called, and they shall be like unto me. Let all their wickedness come before thee, and do unto them, as thou hast done unto me, for all my transgressions. For my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. <coughs> good morning, good evening, good week, weekday or weekend. As Jeremiah laments in the first chapter of his Lamentations, I share in this lamentation. The Lord has rubbed my nose in it because otherwise I wouldn't learn. He has <clears throat> let my enemies have their way with me because otherwise I would not learn. But I will say this, I sigh because I'm not wicked. I'm not a transgressor. I'm not a <clears throat> willing liar, that is, if it's an innocent lie, meaning I don't know it's a lie, and then I find out later that truth is, is in opposition to it, I will change it. I'm not a murderer, as I said. I'm not a one that would um, seek to uh, destroy a, one's reputation for gain. things are pointed out, I would hope it's because uh, of doing good, of challenging people's beliefs about certain people and doctrines. Not intended, you know, to um, attack personally anyone. Not intended to uh, bring about um, some kind of a mano a mano thing with some other uh, commentator on the word some other teacher, preacher, whatever. No, um, my sin is more one of um, being a fool, <laughs> being in denial, lying to myself, you know, wanting to tell myself the truth is what I am wishing for rather than what the truth is regarding in, you know certain individuals in my life yeah who intended to do me harm who intended to, to do me and who intended to, uh, to to kill me where I would subject myself to um, these physical attacks knowing better in the last two years I've been poisoned four times the most recent one the most recent one is some kind of a nerve thing that um, it seems to be going away now but it was like if you move your head one way or the other you get this shooting down your arms and I talked to the chiropractor about it and they thought people thought oh it's obviously a physical thing but no apparently it's not um uh, bioweapons engineered flu bug um, a food poisoning that like an E. coli type of thing a, uh, the worst probably was um, uh, and other things like you know food that was um, tainted and poisoned and so forth and so on and I seem to have recovered but the point I'm trying to make is, in this particular case, oh no, there's nothing new about poisoning a, a minister of the Lord. I mean, that's, you know, there there were other reasons in this case. And um, I just was blinded by my need for love. You know, people pay me to become close to them so they can do me in. Does that make sense? Sickeningly sweet, da-da-da. Here's money. Oh, friend. <laughs> ah, now get him. You know what I'm saying? When I knew better, when the Lord had warned me, 
and I continued to go again. Well, I mean, I'm confessing it now because um, I had put, you know, thank God for the Lord because the Lord has protected me. What is the uh, chapter in Mark that says uh, no poison will by any means hurt, hurt you? I did go through a poisoning in 1997 that did leave me with an ulcer. but uh, So obviously there was like an H. pylori or, or some kind of thing there. And it's plagued me, you know, through... I did one treatment of antibiotics for it, but it didn't take care of it. And, you know, there's other things. You know, just eating right and having uh, probiotics and things kind of keeps it at bay. So you don't even really know it's there. But it's, you know, it's still there. It's still a problem. But that was... Uh, Again, my fault because not, I mean, not completely because that was a long time ago. But the point is, knowing it's like the evidence was right there in my face, you know, what the deal was and what the deal still is. It's just that I had a hard time believing, you know, and I, and I, I, I Perhaps I don't believe in soap operas. I have a hard time believing that, you know, there are some people that are just cold-blooded murderers that will say they love you. You know, I have a hard time believing that. Well, hence, I have learned many things. I don't, you know, let people in. And, you know, yes, I have to have my food sampled before I eat it. And the same thing has also happened, and I've been warned by Brother Thomas and others, you know, that... uh, not to go to the same restaurant to me. It's like a theme in my life of this. But the the poisoning thing just means that I'm not playing heads up ball. I'm being warned. I know ahead of time, okay? But something is blinding me. Some foolish thing. In other words, what a fool believes he sees. And I've I have fallen, you know, I have led my life in that regard. I suppose it's the same thing as not believing, you know, your um you're being held hostage, you know, having the Stockholm Syndrome, you start loving the hostage taker, you know, you start, right? You know, something like, oh, they won't hurt me. They love me. Um, if there ever is a, a day where I need to be more specific, and I'll, I'll know that very soon, um, you know, I will be. Uh, you, you know, the, the, suffice to say, um, I've had... When I walked out of L.A., there were a number of um, threats, including one from significant other who knew all about this gang stalking. You know, in other words, um, the gang stalking was emanating, was there, and my life was actually in danger. And I was told that when I came here, then it wasn't in danger as it was there, you know, people in the house drive by, you know, and poisoning the water, all kinds of things like that, um, and walked out. And like Lot's wife, perhaps, you know, went back in 2008 to try to, I don't know, make peace with people, see if they want to repent. I mean, I don't, I don't even know. But that was obviously a mistake. People who you know know me personally know what you know the situation. Also have advised me as such, and I could not hear that advice. You know, um, you know, love, blood, all that. It's very powerful. Since that time, though, I mean, you know, and then another way I could say, you know, yeah, lancing the wound, I was able to find out that, yeah. In L.A., things, you know, really went bad. Yeah, people that were um, in my trust um, betrayed me. Yeah, um, you know, they were trying to kill me. Yeah, and and it goes back. In my case, there's a money motive for that, among others. When I was 18, and I described to you this coma that they uh, put me into and then blamed me later, uh, was a um, engineered from... The same, it was the same thing. People were hired to do a hit. And for the longest time, I couldn't accept that. I just couldn't, I didn't want to believe, you know? 
I couldn't believe people could be that evil. I just couldn't believe it. You know, I, I believe that people out there, you know, I mean, it, you know, and this has happened repeatedly also with people getting to know me uh, from the ministry. And in one case, one guy um, had come here to kidnap me, you know, and I was friends and I knew the warning signs were there. I just didn't want to believe that he would actually go through and kidnap me and possibly take me out or hold me hostage or some crazy thing. There was even a guy here that, um, with a wife that wasn't his wife and, and, you know, they, they were paid to come here and move here and, you know, rent a house. I added up how much money it would have been for this guy to come here. Then he contacted me. His name was Alan. He contacted me and he said, uh, oh yeah. And also I write screenplays and I write plays and, you know, I guess knowing that I did that when I was in LA and, you know, I'm with the Lord and I really want to know more about the Lord. You know, I'm following your ministry and listening to the, you know, and all that. Let's get together. Just move to Santa Fe. Come meet my wife. So I we actually went and met the wife and and they were not this was not a married couple. This these were two actors and the guy looked like an actor and then I realized these were paid actors. Man, I feel like the dude in the big Lebowski just finding out all this new shit. And then today I have now it's raining and I'm in my office, which is, I have a little trailer that is my office. Uh, that is where I go to do my production. In, increasingly, that becomes my quiet cave or my place. And now it's not so quiet because yesterday I had mosquitoes in here. Now today, the rain, but the rain is beautiful. Oh, it rained all night, folks. It looks like Irish Spring in New Mexico. If you ever, ever have a chance to get down the I-40, Route 66, and pass through New Mexico, it's so green. And it was so drought ridden. We had never had a drought like we had here. I mean, it was just dead. It looked like parched August in in April. But anyway, let me get back to the story. So, you know, so there there he is, and trying to get to know in all this stuff. And then a, finally, a red flag went up, and I was able to resist, and then I started backing off and not returning emails, and you know, making sure that he knew that I knew that he was a plant, but. I had a hard time believing that somebody would pay an actor. I mean, how much do you think it would cost? The guy was here for a, a few months in a house that was easily, what, about three or four grand a month in, in, in Santa Fe. It was more toward the city, more toward the uh, museum side on the museum district, which is kind of out more toward the I-25. Anyway, so there he was. And, um, you know, I figured, okay, two actors... Um, the props, you know, all the furniture and the stuff, you know, I mean, the only thing he had that was real that was his was a laptop. Boy, I would have loved to have seen what was on that hard drive. And then he had some connection with Boeing. Like he used to work for Boeing. And this is like a kind of a theater guy, actor guy, writing screenplay, but he's with the Lord and he's out here making a new start of things. Anyway, when it when it wasn't working, eventually... The guy just disappeared, pulled up stakes. It was like he was never there. And his wife. Anyway, numerous things like that. The stalking incidents over the years were have been, uh, I mean, the first uh, major one was, you know, were happening when I wouldn't, um, you know, join Satan's side. And then they sent all kinds of hound dogs and people my own age who were friends before. People that were my age that were friends before now became assassins. So they, you know, would, would put gasoline all over the back of the car and, you know, and, you know, sabotage stuff and break in and, you know, and all that. And it just wound up me flipping out, you know. So that kind of betrayal, I didn't want to believe that my friends or people that were friends would now be stalking and seeking to, you know, have me off myself or eliminate me and then eventuating in this coma in Denver which was the same thing, which was all orchestrated from Los Angeles um, by people that I trusted.
at that time, being 18 years old, I don't know much. I just don't understand why I, you know, a person would be raised to to be killed. I, I you know, uh, and of course I know about you know sacrifice and you know lambs to the slaughter and you know I know now. You know, I'm not marveling so much now because Jesus said, you know, they hated me, they'll hate you without a cause, and you know, look what they did to him, and they'll do the same thing to you. I mean that they're, they're going to do it whether you're a nice guy or not. You know, I had a hard time believing a dealer would actually sabotage a truck, my truck, and, you know, take the suspension out and loosen it, you know, make it look right, right for an accident, you know, pop the tires, you know, with a, with an X-Acto knife, not pop them and make it very thin so they would pop, which almost um, took me and uh, Mike Horsey and his wife out when we were driving on a dirt road here. You know, good thing I wasn't going fast, but I mean... I had a very hard time believing that the that the Lithia Dodge dealer and the service manager whose name is Tim and the mechanic whose name is Dylan in on Cerritos Road in Santa Fe, if you ever want to look that up, called Lithia Motors, that Lithia would actually sponsor some kind of sabotage of the truck intending um, death. And, and these are people I don't even know. I'm I'm in the category of Paul now boasting. I've prayed to the Lord of what to speak about. So I guess this is protection 101. By speaking about such things, um, it affords me more time. So why would this guy, Dylan, and well, anyway, I had uh, the answer. They were paid by someone to do it, is why they did it. They wanted, yep, just like yesterday's show, they wanted money. And they're willing to kill me to get money. And these are guys that have jobs, you know, Tim being the service manager, Dylan being one of the, uh, you know, the, the other guy in on it is uh, this guy, John, uh, who's a sales guy. And then the manager, you know, you've got the also the sales manager and they all these guys, you know, found out about the Zeph report. And then after that, it was just, you know, total hell. And the Zeph report is there because... At first, I mean, you know, I just couldn't believe all this, but I was just uh, being brought out by the Lord and being put into ministry, you know, oh, well, being thrown up into the saddle and stuff would happen. And, uh, you know, but I'm going at it and I'm also slaying demons and casting out, uh, you know, unclean spirits out of pools and houses and things and Christians are telling me there's no such thing as that realm of the dead and where all these spirits are flying around. I'm saying, yes, they are really real and they are attacking people and you're just absolutely out of your mind. And then I watched myself go through character assassination on the net. So I wondered, who's paying them? Who's paying Lisa Ruby to do that to me? I don't even know her. What's that all about? And most people give her a pass and just say she's really ignorant. But I mean, you know, I just, I believe that she's um, obviously being used, you know, but is she being paid? You know, probably not. I, I don't know. There's been a number of, um, you know, when I was on Coast to Coast, they sent a handler guy, a controller who said he wanted to connect me to the world system so I could make money. But he wanted me to pay him $3,500 to do it. He said, you're not alone. I can help you. After hearing my testimony or whatever I spoke about on Coast to Coast, immediately they send this guy to remedy the situation. Read that. Neutralize me or shut me up, you know. And do you really think that he was going to hook me up to anything or was this just another lure into a dinner where there'd be another poisoning? And then, you know, I mean, I, how can I trust that? Besides that, I, I, I told him on Coast to Coast, I I'm telling you, I didn't want to be hooked up to the world system. That's the whole point. The whole war that's been going on since I was like, you know, a teenager has been all, you know, and before and even since I was like five. And now I have a lot of memories of before five years old being raped and, you know, abused just like any other, you know, I guess just pedophilia, whatever. I mean, but, you know, satanic rituals, pedophilia, all that stuff. And all those memories have come to light, and I'm, that's going to be a subject probably of a book or something where 
because it's really heavy and it's you know it's as heavy as the Bryce Taylor thing and I, I, it's it's just a matter of how to present it. And look what happened to her. She presented all this all this factual stuff and everyone in the world just simply ignored it like it didn't exist. And of course, she's crazy. My daughter advised me, you know, you're going to write about this stuff um, and you're going to be literal about it. They won't believe you. And she's very wise for her age. I mean, she's 21 and she knows, you know, she just knows, you know, a lot about the world. She just, you know, and she um, is like me in every way. And so, you know, she's <laughs> never going to be one of these shallow airhead bitchy Jezebels running around, you know, working for Satan. It's just not in the cards for her. She's more of, if I could describe her, she's a free spirited hippie chick. She's something that I would have met back when I was 18. You know, she's like, like that. And, uh, you know, she's more, more, you're, you're liable to see her. If you're going to see her, she'd be driving around in a Volkswagen bus with camera gear, taking pictures and a dog. You know what I mean? Going for, wandering around the country that's that's her we both have this wanderlust thing so but that's her that's that's you know not at all um but she doesn't have the problems i do in other words there's no she said she hasn't been under attack in italy there's been no um you know despite her being innocent of their way you know she's seen people in high school go you know satan has given her dreams um <clears throat> especially here after this whole um giant uh, events and you know we were out in los angeles and you know it all came crystal clear one day i will explain all this it's, it's all kind of coming to a head it's also coming to a head in the world at the same time it's coming to a head with me but i explained to uh, francesca about you know elijah in the cave and how you know they would send 50 men you know to kill him and they'd all wind up being dead. Then another 50 to kill him, they'd all wind up being dead. Then the third 50, the guy bows down to the Lord. <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to be killed. He's he's bowing down to Elijah, to the Lord. Any, he just doesn't want, you know, want the same fate. And, you know, there is that part of it. And I haven't mentioned in all this that's happened, all the dead bodies and ruined lives that were put up to this kind of stuff and now no longer exist. The Lord has been good to back me up and to and to slay the wicked before they even reach me. I mean, I haven't had any worries. You know, I've been kind of living in a bubble under the Lord's grace and his protection. And I've gotten so spoiled that, you know, I have kind of lost a little bit of discernment where I just, you know, bask in his protection and I forget to give thanks. And, and, and I forget what the battle's all about and that there really is a danger and you just don't go play on the freeway. You know what I mean. I, you know, I've gotten maybe foolish because of, you know, God spoils me in a lot of ways. Well, I mean, he gives me all this, uh, you know, words and he gives me the topic to talk about and he makes it all clear and he makes it so that, you know, and then, I, then you have to wonder this too. <laughs> I really feel like the dude now, you know. You got to wonder this too, you know, um, how come uh, I, others aren't putting the Bible and the spiritual walk and Jesus and Yahweh and the whole thing into this truth that I present. And I'm not saying it as a boast. I'm just saying, why aren't there others? Well, it's not a boast, but I mean, I, I walk in truth. I'm speaking in truth about all these things that happen and the world and what scripture says about it, what Jesus says about it, what God expects of us, how we are to walk through all this. But when I look at my life, there's actually no reason. It's like a million one odds against me being here right now talking to you with how foolish I've been. And, you know, how easily I've fallen into their traps. I didn't fall into the trap at Big Bear, for those of you who followed over a year and a half ago. That was a trap. And there were actually people that were going to come to it that said they were friends of mine. They wanted to meet me, but I don't believe that's true now. I believe they were part of the trap. Not all of them, but a couple of them were definitely... And when they had to cancel their tickets and I never saw them again, I realized, okay, there's something wrong with that person. 
Something wrong with that. I thought the right response would have been, you didn't fall into the trap in Big Bear. Congratulations, you know, the Lord's been good to you and the Lord's blessed me by through your example. That was the right response. Did not happen. That had happened in one or two cases. But I mean, in general, there were some people in con- I was in contact with who said they were listening to audios where they just broke contact off with me, blaming me. And a lot, I mean, why blame me? You know, a lot of what these people do they 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 do things to make you suffer and then when if you act up at all then they blame you for their evil deeds i mean this is a this is an ongoing thing with the lambs it's terrible you know to find you know somebody a lamb lamb meaning someone that is uh a free spirit you know someone that's not in satan slavery they they join Satan slavery, and then I also know people that say they're Christians. And all, there's a guy in L.A. and I talked about him. Well, this guy was a danger, and he's studying the Bible at the L.A. Country Club. I'm like, what part of that? Well, let me give you an example. The L.A. Country Club is the most elite country club. One of the most elite. I think it's like a half a million dollars for a membership. Uh, that's it's 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 exclusive it it abuts beverly hills and wilshire boulevard <clears throat> and then it continues and they have like a dress code and they're very racist you know and eventually in la there was like the jewish club and the wasp club you know and uh and you know the people of entertainment business would be part of well, anyway there's it, it it is the most elite club there is this guy sits on the board of of memberships you know, and I had a vision once where the angels locked it up and just burned it to the ground. Uh, you, you know, they were showing me the wickedness in there and what, what God wants to do to them. For the pedophilia mainly. You know, destroying children. You know, in the name of conformity so they can bring them up. But it's still destru- destruction of children. Anyway, you know, Matthew eighteen six that otherwise would believe it now. And on top of then after they destroy them, then they have Bible study there. And you're talking about the most satanic place in Los Angeles. And yes, Rush Limbaugh goes to L.A. and he plays golf there because he knows people there. And so what does that make Rush? Sorry. It's enough to... It's enough to really break a guy's heart. That... um, I can wander around the, the earth... Spreading love and joy, praying peace and healing, bringing miracles. And those same people then take a knife and want to stab you in the back or in the front or in the neck or whatever. I mean, it breaks your heart. You can sit there like I did with one young actor in L.A. And I just thought for I I talked to him for days. I'm telling you people days and days. And he goes right back to the satanic game. You know, I, it, this is like, um, you know, I heard Ann Coulter talking about liberals, how she could talk to them until she, and, they, and they're nodding and going, uh uh-huh, present all kinds of facts about why, you know, progressivism, socialism doesn't work and blah, 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 you know, and go through it all, nodding their heads like they really get it. And a week later, they're right back where they were. Well, this is true also of, you know, the truth of Jesus, I can explain like I did to this guy, this guy who's the head of, you know, the membership committee of the L.A. Country Club. I can explain, you know, Beverly Hills Real Estate, all that. I can explain to him. For And I spent with him before I left, and, and he knew I was under fire. He knew they were gang stalking me. He knew that was coming my way. And I kept telling him, I'm staying the course. Why don't you join me? He said, I can't do that. I, I don't want to be a bum, and I don't want to be a uh, monk. Or whatever he said, you know. But at the same time, he was handling me. You know, he wasn't being sincere. You know, uh, then there was another guy that got ruined out there that was a favorite classmate of mine when I was a kid, and he changed when he when he when he got his uh, spot in life. He became something else. The two of them are hanging out, you know, in his place in Mexico and on the beach down there, and. So they can't be trusted. And then they contact and say, please email me. Well, didn't I spend months explaining to you 
why you can't be on that side and still have Jesus and the dad, the LA country club. And you can't be a member of the LA country club, man, and have Jesus at the same time. It just, maybe you could be a guest. I suppose you could go into a church or a golf club. I mean, you wouldn't be, it, 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 I'm telling you, it's oil and water. There's no way you can have both. Well, enter in my own hypocrisy. I tried to have both, I guess, in a way. You know, I wanted the, the love of my family, you know, after I had left. And um, I guess I learned the lesson of Lot's wife. If I don't want to be a pillar of salt, I better be more like Lot, you know, just and, and really not look back. And at the same time, as I look ahead, you know, and I wonder if, you know, me and our people, you know, people that are friends, I've got good friends too. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. I have a lot of friends who are like real good friends where you, you know, you speak truth, they speak truth. It's, you know, they're suffering, you're suffering, you know, you, it's um, not like a fake thing. Now, there's also the fake sufferers who act like they're, you know, there's all that. But I mean, there's also you know, quite a number of good friends. I don't think I have more good friends. I mean, real like family, you know, like brothers and sisters than most everyone. I'm very blessed in that regard because of being public, you know, that, that affords me that. So I have a lot of people I can just call and bear my heart and soul to and who they're under their own, you know, they're getting the same pummeling. Oh, brother Thomas is one of them. Definitely. You know, um, He's under fire himself, you know, hunkered down, you know. And, but, I mean, the, you know, we could really have a conversation like here. You know, he's like a, to me, he's like a little brother, you know, because you know, he's young, younger. And he's like a little brother. And I can, you know, like, like you know, same with my daughter. She's like, um, you know, someone who has a lot of wisdom that, you know, you can talk to. And I've, I'm blessed to be surrounded with people like that. So don't get me wrong. It's that the, the old, okay, the old friends family associations, all that, um, there's that game going. And, you know, let me just lay it out. The whole idea is to lure me in through being nice and saying I'm one of you and all that, you know, to, to, you know, obviously uh, do evil. And this was hard for me to learn, Okay. I just couldn't believe that people that were so friendly, family, friends of family, you know, people that, you know, they're really out for vengeance. I mean, they're being nice only for one reason, to lure me in and and do harm. And and I'm being nice. I'm giving them love. I'm praying over them. And it's been a waste of time. I I just, well, look, I can't be specific because there's, and I'm not going to be right at the moment. It's just what's happened to me is I've kind of like woken up to the reality of that situation. I, why has it taken me so long? You know, I guess because I wanted to go back because I blame myself as a, you know, for failing my family as a, you know, I was told that it was all my fault, that I brought everyone grief, that I hurt everyone and I, that it's all my, that I'm bad. And I wanted their approval. And I wanted to be good. I didn't want to be bad. I didn't want to be the cause of everyone's suffering. And now now it turns out, when you look back on it, that that wasn't the case. In other words, I was blamed uh, for something they did. And I didn't understand that. I thought that it was me. And I carried that all these years, that I'm the bad guy, I'm the blame, I'm the loser, I'm the, you know, I'm evil. Or, you know, even though I couldn't, it's not rational. I'm just saying I carried that. So I kept trying to get approval, you know, doing things, you know, becoming proficient at this or that. Or, you know, um, I think that's why I even tried to make movies. I was, you know, I did make movies, but I mean, I was, I I wanted approval. I wanted to overturn the awful things I did when I was, a teenager that I everyone blamed me for, for ruining the whole everything and make up for it. So I've been seeking forgiveness 
since I came back to L.A., I'd gone away. I had been put in an institution in the Midwest, and then I went out and became a musician, and that was part of my therapy, and, you know, playing in clubs, and, you know, because I was, I mean, I had that skill. So anyway, and, but eventually I had to come back to find out what the hell happened, you know? They convinced me, no, there was no satanic ritual going on, that, you know, there was no initiation thing that I said go to hell for, you know. There's no big drama where my father almost got run over by me in a car because they were trying to get me. I mean, you know, I could go through all these things, and I will when the, when the time is right. It, it would, no, it's it's beyond movies. It's it, It's beyond the beyond, okay, in terms of the literal... It's the would be yeah the juicy story, you mean satanic ritual abuse the pedophile network in in Hollywood and Beverly Hills of elite society celebrity society you know like Bryce Taylor too sure you know sure I have a story to tell if I have lots of names and faces and things and just like we have Corey Feldman recently coming out and saying the problem in Hollywood is the pedophile network and my friend who's a producer said he's not going to live long. And that's what you're going up against, you know? I mean, what I reacted to was, you know, the them, the pedophile network of, of Beverly Hills and, and L.A. and the elites, and they, um, you know, and they sent the hit guy out to Denver, you know, I mean, and they or orchestrate the big hit. I mean, they, you know, this is a very powerful organization that is global, and it's, you know, it's Satan. I mean, it's also, you know, satanic ritual and it's the whole thing. But I mean, you could, if you don't want to go there with Satan, if you want to be more secular about it, you can say, yes, it's the, it's, you know, the very powerful Los Angeles pedophile network that runs the entertainment business and also runs all the big industries in Los Angeles. Who, you know, young adults have children and when they come of age, they sell them out into that reality so that they can work and make a living. I mean, that right there just sounds insane. They didn't want to hear that. It, it, anywhere I've said such a thing, they didn't want to hear it. And the reason they don't want to hear it is because twofold. One, um, how is anyone supposed to make a living? It, you know, you have to make, you know, it's a shit sandwich. You're going to have to take a bite, you know, and that's just all there is to it. And so then they go to church and they do it, you know, but this, once this thing gets in, it infects everything. Anyway, so when it came time um, for me to go, yay, I'm with you guys, I said, you know, F you. And then all hell broke loose. Next thing you know, I'm locked up and framed and, and blamed. And then, but I believed it, that it was all my fault, that I was just a kid on drugs and I, and I hurt my parents and I hurt everybody and, you know, and there was no um, ritual. There was no satanic ritual abuse. There was no uh, satanic initiation that I said, screw you to, and, and dramatically in front of all these people, by the way. And there was, you know, and the whole thing that happened in Denver was, you know, uh, was my fault. I independently committed suicide or attempted to commit suicide on my own, which totally hurt my family. And nobody, you know what I mean? There was no orchestrated hit. You know, they got me to believe that none of those things happened. And then I, I did it all myself and I was to blame. I was very confused. Very confused. So eventually after touring around and playing music and doing things in the you know Midwest and so forth, I had to come back to see what was going on. And I had then the support of my... Um, they all wanted me there. And I thought, oh, look how nice they are and look how awful I was. Look how terrible I was and... You know, and, and, and I need to go back and mea culpa and apologize and see if I can now prove myself that I'm worthy, you know, that I'm, I'm not a bad guy. You know, I'm not so evil or whatever. They convinced me I was evil, bad, everything bad. So I wanted to go make it up to them. I wanted love. I wanted approval. You see what happened, folks? And I'm saying this for the benefit of, I think there's a couple of you listening from the same background so understand this you know all that idea that I did something wrong was like mind control that was that was perpetrated by my family you know and then they even put a rumor out that I was dead you know at one point maybe that was to protect me I don't know but you know 
I guess what they wanted was me to come back and finally see that I had made a mistake and to go, okay, Satan, I'm with you. You know what I mean? I think that's probably what it was. So I accepted their support and, you know, their money, which is a big mistake. You know, and they put me up in a house. I had a wife and I had a Range Rover and I had a, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I had this sort of life going and then I had my aunt and uncle. My aunt just passed away last week. You know, and they lived nearby and there were dinners and, you know, and I thought, oh, look, there's a normal life. I had no idea that I was on the Truman Show and the whole thing was fake. I was there to find out what happened. So while this was going on, I developed a thing called panic attack syndrome where I, I just couldn't go out during the day. At night I could. I, found, I went and, um, you know, I took a, uh, I'd gone back to school. You know what I mean? I, I was trying to like be a good guy, to be good. You know, and then when I couldn't go during the day, I had to drop out of school because I couldn't, the panic attacks hit, I couldn't, I couldn't function. I couldn't even drive a car. But at night I could. So I enrolled in a, in a, in a screenwriting class in, in Hollywood. And, um, you know, I'd already been a writer. So, I mean, I just was a matter of, I was there, you know, making contacts. I met, you know, a, a, a couple of people I ended up collaborating with. Anyway, long and short of it is I was there I, writing screenplay. I remember my first script I wrote. It got optioned by a, by a guy at, um, out of USC film school who was just, who got a, some kind of deal to make a film. He was going to make it through USC School of Cinema, which is very prestigious. And so I thought, hey, I, that's, that's really a big pat on the back for my first script. I mean, you know. <laughs> the guy went on. His big claim to fame is he produces Steven Seagal movies. That's where, when he became a, an adult. But anyway, um, so there I was, you know, thinking, hey, you know, and then I, I secretly, but I was having panic attacks, and this doctor out there put me on drugs. He put me on, like, Tofranil and other these drugs that would make it so I wouldn't, you know, flip out or whatever. And they did help. I didn't, you know, but they caused tremendous side effects. Anyway, you know the problem was spiritual, don't you? You know that I, you know, in other words, I had believed this whole thing that was a lie. And I had this whole thing in my head, but the truth started creeping in. You know, I started sneaking at night to write this script. I also had been involved in the real estate business and commercial real estate and, you know, had a broker's license and not a broker, I mean, a, a real estate license, an associate license, whatever. So you could work there and sold buildings and, you know, and I was trying to be, to do good, you see. They wanted me to be a businessman, a businessman, big time businessman. Yeah, big business, big corporation, big jets, big everything. Mm -hmm. Wear the right clothes and belong to the right clubs and. You know, okay, I'll do it. I just, I just want you to love me. I have no business. You know, I'm an artist, soul of an artist, spirit of an artist, whatever you want. Mind, always been a poet from day one. That's what they hated. But anyway, look, here's the thing. So I'm, you know, it. Okay, I got panicked. I can't go out. I can't drive. I can't drive my Porsche around. <laughs> I could only drive my Porsche at night, okay? No, no, I know. You, you know, there's no, I'm not looking for any simple, believe me, you know, I mean, you have the a hole Porsche and you have the a hole this and that and how, you know, you can behave. I've, all, all I know is I've had it, it was taken away from me, and I, I don't care, you know, and I don't care if other people have Maseratis or whatever. I mean, I was just out there and everyone had Maseratis and Bentleys and whatnot, but. And I have a Dodge truck, and I'm happy with that. But, I mean, you know, the point is I'm not into that. This, I was grew up with all that materialism, all that worshiping of stuff and status and all. I couldn't fit, you know, and all this happened, and I've been institutionalized now for four years, you know, and, and through with bouts of depression and going, I couldn't quite make it. You know, I went to a halfway house, and I couldn't, I just was so depressed I couldn't get going. I, things I didn't understand, you know. 
I didn't, you know, so I was in no way ready for LA. It's just that I had this nagging thing that my healing, I couldn't heal from whatever it was. And now it's mind control that they put on me. You know, I couldn't heal unless I went back to L.A. to find out what happened. I couldn't just settle down on a farm in Kansas and go, oh, okay, and just have a nice little life, you know, growing tomatoes or, or wheat or something. I, You know, I had to go back to find out what happened. So anyway, I'm there for, you know, a few years and, you know, I'm bombing out in real estate, bombed out in school, bombed out in everything. I'm, I'm, I'm under medication, under a psychiatrist you know, medicated to the hilt and I'm just really unhappy and really troubled and, you know, and I feel like my whole life is arranged. I mean, you know, where'd this house come from? Where'd this wife come from? Where, where did these instant friends come from? You know what I'm saying? It was like the Truman show. And, um, so I'm sneaking this project and I'm sneaking into my, um, you know, my, the second bedroom, which was made into a writing studio. I'm sneaking in there and writing this script about this satanic ritual and in, in Beverly Hills. You know, and I'm so afraid of it. I don't even know why. I, I lock it in a drawer, and I, 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 one day I went through convulsions under the desk because I, it, it was bringing me to convulsions and, 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 and panic attacks, and, and, and I was throwing up and stuff writing this. Because remember, nothing like that ever happened. See, they they put like Nazi shrinks on me, and nothing like that ever happened. Well, I got it to a point where I wrote maybe a hundred or one hundred and fifty pages. You know, I mean, I couldn't bring it in. You know, script's supposed to be one hundred and twenty pages, but I couldn't quite bring it in for a landing. And there was a guy from the writing class that I, you know, I met and collaborated. And he put a, then he wrote a draft of it. I mean, he became completely intrigued with the story of a kid that was, uh, you know, raised to be killed, basically, in a satanic ritual sacrifice with everyone having an orgy and, and great fun over the whole thing. Anyway, it eventually became a movie, and they wrecked the movie, and they wrecked the plot, and I distanced myself from it. I didn't want anything to do with it, but... Or them, or any any part of it. I mean, I you know, I, I, at first I embraced it, but then I realized they just made me into a fool. They made the story into a fool. It was, but it helped me to understand. It, but, but even after that, still I wanted to check how people were reacting, and they weren't treating me, they weren't, you know, I guess they didn't feel threatened that I would even wake up. But this one uh, casting agent... Um, had an assistant, and that assistant used to, like, you know, teach tennis at my... Well, I never lived in their house in Beverly. I was already out and gone, and, you know, I guess I was going to be, you know, you know, with the shrinks the rest of my life. But anyway, she taught tennis there. They had a tennis court. <laughs> she since married some rich guy. But anyway, she called me up. She was working as the assistant. She goes, I just read the script. And how are you? I, I, I'm okay. I just want you to know I read the script and everything you wrote is all true, 100%. And I flipped out. I mean, I flipped out. I went insane. And I went flying off to Italy, chasing after the you know this girl that uh, I had met and eventually became Francesca's mother. But I mean, I just disappeared in Italy for a while. And then Italy kind of went, I bombed out there and I had to come back and be under the care of doctors and stuff. And then the guy that, you know, optioned the script, you know, bought the director and everyone, they they goofed up the story to make it some kind of weird, you know, like kind of satirical comedy about um, alienation and youth. And they couldn't, the script I had done originally was literal. I mean, it was like a literal balls to the wall. It was phenomenal. And they took it and goofed it up and made it into some cheesy, stupid, awful thing. I mean, something, that, you know, and, and, and made light of the subject matter. You know, in other words, they, they made the movie, but then sidelined the whole truth of it, of why I was even writing it. And then they hated me. The director hated my guts. And, you know, so 
may I say it? I mean, the money supposedly came from the production company was called Wild Street Pictures or whatever, and their money came from Japan, from um, like um, industrial companies. They were they were in bed with uh, like NEC and you know uh, I don't know Mitsubishi and you know big corporate concerns were getting involved in f- having their people here, having the Japanese come here and learn to make movies, and they were funding. They funded this one. So that funding didn't come from, um, you know, the L.A. elite. It was done independently with Japanese money. It was only like a million to to make it. You know, it wasn't at that time it was quite a bit of money. That'd be like making a film for around five million independent, which a studio would take eighty million to do. <laughs> but anyway, they ruined it. And uh, then I, looking back on it now, I have to say it was all. I feel that the production. This is, I'm such a fool. Folks, if you knew what a fool I was. My daughter has more wisdom at her age than I have today. It seems. I was such a fool that I went along with it. And I was made into somewhat of a clown. A laughing stock. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, he's crazy. He's a crazy guy. Mm Mm-hmm. So the film effectively sidelined me and silenced me, and and I, I got paid for it. Well, there's a reason that there's you know some kind of testimony going on. First of all, you haven't heard for me to do my whole testimony about all this stuff. I'd have to go back, all the way back to you know, and and, and you say, well, where's the Lord in this? Well, at that time, I was thinking I had it. May I thought I was in the driver's seat. But something was wrong, because, I mean, you know, obviously. And uh, what I feel like now is that that production company and the people involved were intentionally, uh, you know, Brian Usna, Keith Wally, uh, even Rick Fry to a lesser extent, but others were intentionally, intentionally obfuscating the truth of that script to make it acceptable, to not step on any toes, and to, you know, they wanted to get a movie made for their own pocketbooks, you know, for their own careers, I mean, obviously. But they goofed it up on purpose, and I believe the reason for that was because they were covering for the satanic elite, pedophile elite network of of L.A., and they they just, they got it, they bought it, they brought it in, and they did what they did, and, and effectively neutralized the entire message, so the message never got out. It was just, oh, crazy movie, <laughs> you know? So they got their movie made and um, neutralized the missile coming in to hit the target, you know, both at the same time, in which by handling me, then they got a reward to do a bunch more movies. I did a couple more, but I mean, I realized it was the Truman Show. I was just given those jobs because they were paid to handle me. Isn't this awful? I mean, right now, I just feel like, you know, why didn't I just put a bullet to my head right then? I should have just jumped off a building right then. Which, of course, they would have all cheered. And it all goes back to my having said, F you. And the reason I did was because I was sick and tired of being molested. Because I had been molested when I was a child. Because I had been, you know, um, put into those... There was nothing new to me by the time I was, you know... 15 or 16, I already been through all that. And it was like, my soul wouldn't go there. And I just, you know, it was on no, but hell no. And, you know, you say no to that, to that elite pedophile satanic network. Cause I mean, all everyone involved in it that they're dealing with is they're having sex with children. I mean, that's what they do. That's the main thing they're covering up. That's the main guilt and shame thing that causes them to kill people that find out about it. And the movie, ironically, is about a society in... Beverly Hills that kills to keep his existence a secret. I mean, you know, and they claim to be from like a, some, you know, a different species or, you know, and whatnot. But I mean, that was part of the obfuscation. These people are human. But they owe their, um, you know, production companies and acting and uh, real estate companies and uh, Mercedes Benz companies and dental practices and psychiatry practices and law enforcement 
you name it, they're in it. And it's all covered. I mean, LA is one of the most corrupt. In that regard, it is the most corrupt city in the world. When you talk about human trafficking, snuff films, pornography, pedophilia, satanic ritual abuse, satanic Satanism at the high level. At the high level, Satanism, it all, always involves children. I wrote, I wrote a script about it <clears throat> with this producer. We knew it would never get done, but we wrote a script called The Whammy. I should just read it to you if I can find it. We call it The Whammy. It was vengeance upon all those people. But who were the people going to these parties where they would ship children from an orphanage in and then do satanic rituals with these children from an orphanage? And then it, the movie was about these vigilantes who, who got hooked up with some machine that would dispense drugs to them like from another planet, like like Ezekiel's wheels, would distribute down in some warehouse in L.A., and uh, they would become like possessed with a mission, but possessed by by the force of good. But and then all these weapons would be in a vehicle they were in, and they would go to like one of these houses where these parties were going on, where they were shipping in children and all these elite senators and you know top people and everything were there, and they would come in with their machine guns and just and and bombs and everything and just blow everyone away. And then disappear it. Nobody, you know, no one could figure out who they were. They were vigilantes. So, of course, that had about as much... I mean, think about how naive you'd have to be to write that and then actually send it around to a couple people, say... And they just laughed. They just, they read it and they said, that's a great script. They started laughing. You know, if you think you're going to get that made, you have to be... You're out of your mind to have even written it. But, of course, that was my desire that, the you know, this whole thing would be eliminated. And then... That eventually led to that was back in around 1998 when I you know when we did that, and that eventually just led to my realization that you know this is a spiritual reality. Obviously, um, the initiation of Satanism is a spiritual one. Um, the pedophilia that is going on, and all satanic rituals involves children. So it's I guess all ped. I mean, if you say pedophile network, you're talking about Satanists. It's the part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, because there's a lot of spirits involved in that. You know, and they harness those spirits and that spiritual energy and that sexual energy and, you know, the obviously the life force and all that's all involved in witchcraft and, you know, and they're very powerful. You know, I was a fool going up against them. And my friend out in L.A. goes, yeah, you went up against the whole world. I, I couldn't do what you did. Nobody could. You know, with the way they treated you and what happened to you, I didn't want them to have that to happen to me. They tried to make me an example, see what not to do. But still, I didn't understand. And I think that was part of maybe the Lord blinding me so that I it actually helped me to survive in a way because I still didn't get it. And when I, you know, finally laid down my life to the Lord completely where I said, you know, I'm beyond death. I just want to die. And I'm actually, I'm so far, I'm beyond even the concept of suicide. I'm so dead. I'm so gone. I'm so troubled. And then like, you know, 1999 or so, I just said, Lord, if you have anything you want to do with this life, if you want to do anything with me, I, I have nothing. I'm all out of moves. I am. I lost. I am dead. I'm gone. I'm. It's over. There, sir. My enemy is surrounding me, and it's not long before I, I'm not even on this planet. I mean, it's really gotten bad. People, you know, coming in the house, wiring it up, surveillance. You know, we're on cameras twenty four seven. You know, they were just watching us on closed circuit TV and. Seemed everyone in the neighborhood had, had a computer monitor was able to watch us go here, go wherever we went. They had a camera on us, and it was like, uh, "What are you going to do?" We were under that kind of scrutiny because of the fact that I had uh, started preaching the word. You know, I laid my that the Lord lifted me up, and He just He was there. The Father revealed all this stuff to me and revealed how damaged I was because I didn't. Again, I was not integrated. You know, I was still. Um, confused and messed up, you know, totally. So, when I bowed down, laid it all down for him to serve him as a minister, is to pre to, to use the talent I have of speaking to preach and all that. Um, you know, then all hell broke loose. But then he just guided us right out throughout the midst of them. And then I understood that it's all about Jesus. 
all this has all been about Jesus. There was nothing new under the sun back, you know, that I thought was so exotic, you know, like, like driving your car down the street. You people in gang stalking will appreciate this. I drive my car down Sunset Boulevard. I mean, this is very, you know, salesy stuff. You know, Sunset Boulevard, cars, you know, chicks in mini skirts, you know, parties and, you know, whatnot. I'm driving down Sunset Boulevard and all these people come out to their, to the, um, you know, edge of the street and stare at me. That was one of the scenes in the movie that was taken out. You know, I mean, it would make a person completely paranoid if you saw that kind of orchestration. You would call it gang stalking, but that was, I mean, what technology would cause that to happen? You know, seeing, you know, it was so controlled and these people didn't even realize they were all under some kind of a hypnotic or some kind of control mechanism, um, you know, that you'd see an invasion of the body snatchers or something. And, uh, you know, and then my friend would say, yep, that's what you're going up against. That's what, you know, that can all stop today. I'd already been sexualized, you know, when I was, I remember when I was maybe five years old, when I realized something was wrong. I, I was looking out the window at, the, you know, there's a girl on the other side in another house. And there I was like five, um, and both of us are masturbating, looking at the other one through the window across the street at five years old. I mean, I don't know. I mean, so I already knew right there. Well, obviously back before then something had happened to get that sort of perversion, that kind of perverse thing going. You see what I mean? And so anyway, I resisted it. I mean, when they tried to put me in rituals back then, I, I screamed and yelled and got, eventually I got to the point where I was traumatized where I didn't want anyone to touch me and be around me. I didn't want anyone to see my body naked, nothing, you know, it was like that. And I think that shame and guilt that came in from being sexualized or from, from, you know, uh, the ritual abuse and so forth got to a point when I was like a teenager, I didn't want anyone to, you know, I had a phobia of my, my body and about, you know, all kinds of things. So, and, and a social phobia and all kinds of phobias. You know, I, I had all these phobias because of um, the trauma. I hadn't dealt with the trauma that had happened. No matter. The whole point is they want to keep that. They don't want what you read about in Bryce Taylor's book and all that is so horrific. It's so beyond even the ability of most people to fathom. That should have been the most important book of all time ever written. But because it's so horrific, people just reject it. They can't believe it. They have to reject it. It's just to think that there's a system in place like that, and that's what runs the world, and that's what runs all these countries, corporations, golf clubs, you know, societies, you know, uh, guilds. It would just, it would, you just would cry and weep for the rest of your life if you knew the truth of just how bad it is. And the, the, the shit that I've seen is so bad that that I, even to this day, still have to block it out. I remember one person laughing, going, well, don't you want to put a gun in your mouth and get out of here? Isn't it time to commit suicide? Isn't it time to, you know what I mean? It was taunting me, just enjoying pushing me off the cliff. But like I say, you know, and then the other thing they do is, like I say, they, they, they push you like that to the point of suicide. Then they put the gun in your hand and then when, then they blame you when it was all gang stalking or all, you know, they blame you. So gang stalking, nothing new. Um, the kind of mobbing, mob stalking and stuff that you see now, like in, you know, is also orchestrated by the same people. It comes from the same place. Same same thing, different flavor. It's more like class warfare. And Brother Thomas has talked about that quite a bit. You, you know, that that's a little bit different flavor of coming from the same point. Communism, global, New World Order, all that. It's just, New World Order is just means an open pedophile network where pedophilia becomes legal, you know. But really what they want legal is they want satanic ritual and all that legal because... They don't want to be powered by guilt and shame either. They want it all out in the open. So they have their symbols all out in the open, you know, the shaft of Baal, the various gargoyles and demons and, this, you know, who run principalities and powers over different cities and things. You know, it's just really horrifying. When I talked to Pat Holliday, bless her soul, I, 
um, you know, she helped put my mind at rest that this was all, you know, and Bishop Kenko, and I only talked to him once on the air, but also with him, you know, he explained the whole thing and this whole, this whole thing very well, but it, it also made me very sad, right? I couldn't even handle it. And if you dwell on all this stuff enough, it'll just ruin your life. It'll ruin your mind. You, you, you'll become so bummed out with life, you, you won't be able to carry on. You'll think this is such an evil place. I mean, what's the point? What's the use? And then, worse than that, is to see your own family involved in it and realize that, you know, if you don't get on the same page with them, they'll just put a bullet in your head and, and, and blame you. You know, or, or, or that there is just no love. You probably haven't gotten a podcast like this since 2002. This will probably be pretty... Uh, thinking about it, do I really want to put this up online? Uh, I think it falls under the realm of, you know, God's guidance. The, my father's guidance. He's guiding me to do this because probably I pissed them off. You know, personally, I've called them on the carpet on all that. And so there's probably some sort of reprisal in the offing. So I want to make sure that I'm on the record with some of the testimony. I have a lot more. I mean, I have I have um, years worth of stuff that, I mean, if, you know, do you need me to multiply examples? I mean, I've given you the main points, you know. Um and like I say, they have endless amounts of money. They send people, they put them up in houses, they become your friend. You know, all those kind of games are good. How can a kid understand that? You know, being assigned friends. You know, having roommates in a, in a you know, with, uh, you're going through, say, drug rehab, which is what, you know, the, my treatment was, really drug rehab, right? And the roommates were assigned to work on me. Yeah, you know, how many? How much would that cost? Now, how much does all this cost? And what what makes you or me so important that they would spend all this money following you around? I mean, why? So it made me the you know, the ultimate minister of Jesus Christ is what all this all this led to. All this forced me to become that you know prophetic you know, person, servant of the Most High God in bonds to Jesus Christ, thankfully and forever. Thank God, amen. World without end. Jesus without end, amen. Jesus, Yeshua, Yahushua, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahweh. The one is my way. And so all this led, because I was so confused and so traumatized, and traumatized even up to, I'm still traumatized, folks. I... My daughter, thank God, she's just like me. I mean, almost like a carbon copy in every way. Not every way, but I mean, you know, there, she has a lot of the faults I have, a lot of just instinctual traits I have that I thought were just learned that she does the same thing, you know, even to the choice of words and phrases. It's uncanny. But anyway, the thing about her that I like is, well, thank God she escaped. See, they started working on her. Just, you know, we came out for, and they started in already. And, well, I think they realize it's a waste of time because if her soul, the kind of person she is, you know what I mean, is like, there is just no way. I, they think that anybody, they go after anybody other, you know, thinking they can get them. And then, of course, the, the default, if it doesn't work, meaning you don't convince them to sign on and, you know, do something to corrupt themselves so they can be blackmailed. That's how you get in. I mean, and then, you know, then you're a slave and you got to do what you're told. But, you know, but they promise you, you know, Porsches and things, you know. Of course, I got my Porsche for doing nothing. I got mine as a prop in a movie. And, you know, uh, I'd watched the movie Moho and Drive and showed that to her last night. And yeah, you know, caution, that movie has lesbian sex in it and it's graphic um, I don't think that was David Lynch's intention in making the movie. It was going to be a TV series that was canceled immediately. I do believe that this movie tells a story 
about how people live in like a dream world, you know, and Hollywood is run like how it's run and all that, but they don't go into the whole pedophile aspect of it, you know, and but kind of alluding to it. I mean, the, the way they use people. See, the age barrier of like, you know, 18 to whatever, you know, 18 back to whenever, you know, children and using children in movies and things. Um, they don't see that there should be a barrier with, you know, um, children in terms of, you know, sexual or initiating them into the... A lot of the children you see, they're very precocious. It's because they've been around adults and in rituals and part of the system and working in the system since they were three or four years old. So by the time they get to be seven or eight, they they sound like 25-year-olds. But there's a reason for that. It's not natural precociousness. They're also program multiples, and there's a whole Illuminati thing. You know, people got on me for saying monarch, that the monarch thing was really a meme, and that, you know, those who say monarch are really um, shills, and I saw that online. Um, I can't verify a program called, quote, monarch, unquote. I did interviews about it and talked about it and uh, agreed that some of my guests, like Jane Whiting and others, um, had, you know, claimed to be monarch multiples, But let me just explain, whether you want to call it monarch or not, let's throw out the whole term monarch and, you know, you still have the military industrial complex completely all involved in this and all the work that we did with with Laurel Canyon, which is, you know, part and parcel with L.A., the music business, David Crosby, uh, just, you know, David Geffen, uh, Geffen Records, Frank Zappa, the Whiskey A Go-Go, you know, all this, all that that's going on, plus then, you know, uh, the uh, LAPD, um, the, um, you, you know, uh, LA corporations, like, okay, you had Boeing, Lockheed, you know, back in those days, uh, you, you know, the movie industry and all that. And it's all kind of working together. You know, you had the clubs, LA Country Club, you had the Hillcrest Country Club, which was the Jewish Country Club. You had, you know, business associations. You had this whole network that I know all about all of it. I mean, I know all the networks, all the ins and outs, all the stuff. And uh, like the Lebowski, you know, all, a lot of ins, a lot of outs. But I'm just like Lebowski, an idiot. I'm a complete, absolute moron and fool in their world. Don't you understand that? I, you know, the reason they didn't, you know, do anything to me back when I was like, uh, when I came back to L.A. is because they just patted me on the head like a little baby, you know, like, oh, Poor, poor little boy, you know, and that's, and it just stayed like that. No threat to anybody, no threat to them. I was always troubled on the verge of suicide, though, because now I realize because people would, would traumatize me in order to feed like vampires off the trauma and they, they either pick me or anyone like me that, and you know, you stay, it's like being in the black widow's lair where you're wrapped up in the silk. And they're keeping you barely alive, but they're keeping you alive. You're being kept alive by the Black Widow, actually, until it's time for you to be killed. See what I mean? So that was kind of it. You know, that was... I had no power, you know. I had no... I, I thought I had a life. I had no life. And I had thought I had, I had no energy. They took all my energy. But I, I kept on anyway, you know, because I wanted to go back to L.A. after that to find out what happened. And when I finally did start making real inroads in it was when the Lord tapped me. I mean, he chose me for service. And that day, the next day, all hell broke. I mean, it, and it's been all hell broke loose ever since then. How many death threats? How many, you know, dangerous things? How many dangerous situations? You know, how many? You, you don't know the half of it because I don't tell, I don't, I didn't speak a lot of this on the air. But I mean... And who are the players? Who are their names? Where do they live? I know where they live. But when you get there and you finally, you know, and I'll say hello to them, I don't even know what you're dealing with. To me, they seem like robots. They just have program responses to everything. There's no heart inside them, folks. There's, there's no soul in there. And then they raise their children and they, they, their souls are gone. And, and this makes me recount this incident at um, this one hospital setting where I mean, this is going to sound pretty exotic, but I mean, there were, the point of this was for kids would go in, you know, I guess misfits, and the next thing you know, they would change. And suddenly 
and then they'd start mocking like people like me and other but and then they'd be all well and go and, and go return to society all's well you know like their souls were scalped they were just taken out of their body and replaced with this obedient like hive mind type soul then their whole demeanor changed you know if they're fat they lost weight they got the girl they got the car they got everything just fell into place they became winners instead of losers and I watched this like a factory, one after the other after the other. And, you know, and yeah, the, quote, aliens, if you like, they were running it. And they had aliens there in human form who, I know, this is where the story now makes me look like an absolute idiot. But it's, you know, I want to soft pedal that because, you know, that's one aspect of, I, I need to mention that the alien thing is part of all this. It's it's intertwined with it. Well, yeah, it's demonic, and, you know, the demonic realm is intertwined with it. If you want to just say demonic, you can do that. But when I say alien, I mean not human, but in human form, but like a hybrid. hybrid. And then that was connected into the military-industrial complex who were, who were involved with the scalping of souls. In other words, to get you to conform to that reality, but in conforming they take your soul literally so that a lot of people are just programs in other words you talk to them they have like a robot has program responses they have program responses to whatever you say when they get together with each other they they do what the oversoul or the witch queen or the one over them will have them do in the spirit and usually it's they do dutiful things and rituals and whatever for the benefit of the of the circle, which is the, you know, circle of shame, queen of heaven, whatever you want to call it. It, it, it all goes to the, um, all the intention, all the energy, all the rituals, all the uh, pain, all the trauma goes to feed the monkey, which is the dragon. That I saw when I was like 17. You know, I, I saw that, that structure. And, you know, and then when I mentioned it, of course, that was, uh, you know, up the Thorazine 50 more milligrams. You know what I'm saying? That, that was like the end of me. So I shouldn't have mentioned that. Obviously, if I valued, I eventually learned to play the game and say, I, I don't see nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, I'll do whatever you say, you know. Um, okay, so then the other part, accepting that people that... You were in their family. You were with them. Would actually want to do away with you. You know, people that were your friends. You, you know, you know the, that whole game of smiling, you know, luring you in um, to eliminate you, murder. In other words, I'm just beginning now to get my mind around that one. That there are people that you would trust that seek to be trusted allies that really just want to do you in. And there's a lot of the, and, and these were, you know, could be old teachers, you know, mother, father, sister, brother, even children would turn into those kind of monsters. Making the whole thing a tremendous horror movie. You know, you know, beyond Rosemary's Baby, totally. Um, and they do this, and they have killed, and they've killed many. Because they're different, whatever. I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a situation where there isn't, say, money, and, you know, I'm so far removed from it now, I wonder how I'm going to, you know, pay my bills. <laughs> but in a situation... Well, at this point, I mean, you know, they can do whatever. I'm, I'm just saying, I've probably, I've squandered, you know, by confronting them, and by saying the truth, um, you know, I probably thrown away uh, any kind of, you know, everything. But the point is, if you want to be a slave to money, they get you that way. You can't be a slave to money. 
those of you working a job where there's a boss, you know, sometimes you got to confront you, you. You have to not just butter up the boss because your soul is compromised. And I if and I've had to get to that point, you know, in recent uh, months where I had to say. Where I had to just say the truth, even if it cost me, especially if it does, because that's what Yahweh's looking at. He's testing us to see if. You know, if money is going to be a lure to get us or if, you know, um, love is going to be a lure to get us, you know, lust is going to be, a lure. you know, money is another one. Money is very powerful. Most of the people in this thing wouldn't even be involved. In Look, would they kill their own mother for a hundred grand? How about a, how about five grand? You know what I mean? The answer for most of these people, unfortunately, is yes. So that's where the murder aspect comes in. They'll do it because there's money involved in it. Not because to eliminate you because you're a threat, because you might say the truth about, oh, Satan is in... Oh, tell me something I don't know, you, you effing idiot. You know, that's not a threat. It's the money. Oh, you mean I just off this guy, I get five grand? Fine. You know, what do I have to do? Make a phone call? You know, they all have their part. Sure, they'll all jump on that. Most of these people go to church and even run churches. They run religions. They run cults. So how does one beat it? Folks, there's only one way to beat it. There's, you know, there's only one way to do anything. You get your face in the scriptures. Right now, let me go to uh, the Psalms. You get your face in the scriptures. I'm telling you, I have no tolerance for these these a-holes either I, I, you know what you finally have to say people that you might have respected or liked in the past you know what i mean and that you you have to finally say these people are absolute look you want to know my perspective on it these people are losers they are lost and they're gonna burn in hell i mean they're gonna burn baby they're gonna burn that crack in the obelisk that we just saw in satan's penis that's very significant to them they know what that means. The jig is up. If they don't repent like right now, they're just going to burn. Because the Lord will never give them a chance to repent. If you hear my voice and you don't repent, you're going to burn. You know, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of, of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and they shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would, that, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God in my mother's belly. Okay. So in other words, rejected of Christ. But let me get to this other thing. For dogs have compassed me about, and the, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and feet. I may tell all my bones they took and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots among my vesture. Now this is all Jesus, but just look at what's said. But he uh, be not, but be not far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste to help me, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. You see, at the time of David, he's surrounded by people that want to kill him. Surrounded every day, all day long, as you can imagine. All kinds of intrigues going on in the kingdom. All kinds of people getting dead because of this game. And there's a part in Isaiah that said, I am the Lord, I declare righteousness. I say, I declare what is right. Basically with David, the Psalms can be summed up as follows. He's surrounded by enemies. The wicked have encompassed him about, or, and sometimes he's done wickedly and he, and he wants the Lord's forgiveness. But in every case, he relies on the Lord for protection and strength. Um, when you feel they are enclosing you about and they're swarming about, you grab your Bible, as I do, 
It's all in there. All the straight and pray the song. I just pray the Psalms. So you pray that, and if you pray um, Psalm twenty-two is the Jesus promise Psalm. Um, And, you know, you can pray just about any of them. But uh, let's just put it this way. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. In other words, he's got your back. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He makes my feet like hinds feet and setteth upon the high places. He teaches my hands to war uh, so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. A bow of steel is broken in my arms. Thou hast also given, in other words, great strength. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Thy right hand shall hold me up and thy gentleness has made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip, meaning you will prosper, you will increase, even though the world may say differently, it's not true. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them, neither did I turn again until they were consumed. David slew many enemies. God was with him, that's why he went and slew them. Make no mistake, this is a bloody war. Make no mistake, the Lord hates pedophilia, he hates um, Satanism, he hates... uh, satanic ritual abuse. He hates children who are innocent being used in, 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 in their rituals. He hates children being initiated into um, you know, the criminal, the dark side when they're 13 years old or 14 or 15 you know, and get started in, and then get in the fraternities, sororities, clubs and all that. He hates all that. He hates all of it. Any affiliation like that requires an oath. The Lord has said, I will not accept an oath from any of you. You have an oath? If you have so, even an oath to money, if you're buttering somebody up because you think they're going to give you some money, right there, you have blocked the Lord out of your life. You are in violation right at that moment. Do you understand? You are compromised in that moment if you butter someone else because you think they're going to give you money or keep you on the job or whatever. I'm telling you, the money is really the worst thing because people think they're not compromising when they are. Certainly, I've done that. I certainly did that. I, you know, I grew up in that environment. I mean, that's, that's the Lord's going to, you know, is wean, wean me off slowly off that sort of thing. But I mean, you know, that was just everyone buttering everyone up front. That was just the way, you know, you were taught that, you know, that, that's something that has to be unlearned because that right there is the love of money, the lust for money. The, it, it was, is the root of all evil. And that gives them license to play those games. I must say that in terms of stocking, in terms of things happening, I, I don't really worry about it at this point. And interestingly enough, the more fervent I am with the Lord, the less stuff happens. The more that I've got a compromise, I've got some kind of a, if I have a compromise, even if it's an unseen one, and then the Lord will send prophets to tell me, hey, you know, you might be, you know, compromised here or there. You know, obviously we're going to be making mistakes every day. But the point is, is you can't have a basic fundamental compromise. I will butter up the boss to keep my job, but it, it, if it, it goes against you know, if it goes against principles. In other words, if I don't say something about the corruption going on, so if, let's say there's a, a satanic thing going on at work and you're kind of trying to slip through it, not make waves, and, you know, you want to keep your job. I understand that. But what I'm saying is there's a line there somewhere where it becomes compromised, where the Lord is blocked from your life. You'll be rewarded if you stand up against it and you go, you know, not only no, but hell no. Someone told me to butter up a family member. I said, I can't do that. No. I can't do that. I can't lie. I have to be honest. You know, I got a problem with satanic ritual abuse, dude. So I can't be honest about that. I got a problem with, uh, you know... Uh, you people murdering people. I, I'm going to have to be honest about that. You know, you people murdering people and getting away with it because you think you're above the law because you have law enforcement in your pocket and all that. Maybe that's the way of the world. It's been going that way for thousands of years. I still have a problem with it. You want me to butter you up so you give me some money? So look the other way on that kind of thing? I'm sorry, but if I did that, my Lord would kill me. So do what you know. do what you will. Punish me if you like. Or not. The point is, I cannot 
I am, it's illegal. If I want the power of the Lord and the protection of the Lord and the leading of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord and the love of the Lord, because I've, I have no mother and father. So basically, um, if your mother and father forsake you, then the Lord will never forsake you. That's the only place I can go for mommy or daddy. And that was decided when I was, a, you know, when I was, unfortunately, when I was five years old, I realized I had no mother or father. Oh, I got caught up in the games and trying to get the approval. I want love. I tried to be good. Oh, man, I tried to be good and fit in. I really tried. I took the blame for everything, for all their unhappiness. I wanted to please them so they could finally say, it's okay now. But the only thing that would make it okay is if you, you know, jump off the cliff too, if you will. And, um, you know, if everyone does that, then there is no world, then there is no goodness, then there is no light, it's only darkness. And also, anyone that does that is saying, I don't give a damn about children, they can all just go to hell. I want my money and my life and to hell with you. So anyone that joins that is saying, screw the children, it's okay if you kill them, you know, have sex with them, do whatever you want with them. Have that innocence everywhere you can find it and destroy it, but I want mine, so I'll say yes. This is where New Age religion comes in. See, New Age religion makes all these pedophiles and Satanists feel good. Like, you know, they think their soul is going to hell. I can tell you this. If you're in that and you're using New Ageism to make you feel okay, you're going to burn, all right? You're going to burn in hell for eternity. I'm telling you, I haven't been the biggest fervent guy on hell, but it's about time I uh, started putting that card on the table because it's real. You will burn in hell and you deserve it. And a lot of these people go, like they'll tell me, don't worry about my soul. My soul is just fine. And I'm like, you, what part of burning in hell don't you understand? What kind of, what part of Daniel's everlasting shame and punishment don't you understand? Without Jesus and the blood of Jesus and changing, repenting means changing direction, you will burn in hell if you're anywhere part of any of this stuff. That goes to everybody in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Brentwood, Westwood, Pacific Palisades, Hollywood, Hollywood Hills, all you people that are involved in the entertainment business and all that who think that's fine to be part of that, you're going to burn in hell and there's just no other way to look at it. Not only that, you're not going to live on earth because you're already dead. In other words, the demons already are programming you and you, you're just like a robot with pro. You're not even there anymore. So, I mean, you know, you're, you already have a preview of hell and the next step is you're going to burn in hell point is you don't you're not in possession of your soul so if you die without the possession of your soul you're eternally cut off from god which is also another definition of hell because without god it's all darkness and all pain and suffering all right so that's the point now with me going over my testimony i mean here here's what i feel bad about i feel bad that i took the blame and that i agreed to be programmed that it was all my fault, whatever it is, you know, to be a, their scapegoat in exchange for provision, which I didn't know I was doing at the time when I was really young. I had no idea. But um, that's what they used me for. You know, they'll say, well, you were on drugs. No, I was given drugs by my parents and given drugs by the, the coaches at school. And, and I was also given drugs by the shrinks to self-medicate myself because I felt suicidal most of the time. <laughs> and I felt so filled with guilt and shame. And then I eventually would take on the, all the faults of others and whatever they did, I would take the blame for it. So that my job was just anyone did anything wrong, it was, it's my fault. It's all my fault. It's all my fault. I caused it all. And that was the meme. And that's how actually was my function. I think that's, you know, during that time, um, the, you know, the, 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 no, you, you know, the, that I hurt my parents because, and my family and friends because 
uh, I took drugs or because I did this or did that. Let's, let's go to the actual truth because I was given drugs because they gang stalked and hit me um, and overdosed me. And then they said, I did it to myself. Well, I didn't do it. There were like 15 or 20 people involved in that hit. Because they just decided that I was, a, you know, a loose cannon, a threat. Who knows what the deal was? You know, they decided I wasn't going to blend in. I wasn't going to get it. You know, they couldn't just leave me there. It's either put me in an institution or get rid of me. Well, the, you know, okay, fine. But now, because at that time, I just didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe there was such a thing as Satanism. I didn't want to believe there were Satanic rituals. I didn't want to believe that there was Satanic ritual abuse or that I was abused. I didn't want to believe any of that. And if anyone presented anything like that to me, I'd tell them to go to hell. You can't do that. Don't you see the jig is up? You don't have any options. And I'd say, well, I do have an option. This is wrong. And... I'm not going there. And part of the reason I didn't go there was because I felt so much guilt and shame. And I felt ashamed of myself and ashamed of uh, my body and ashamed of um, sex and ashamed of everything. I felt total shame. And that shame actually saved my butt. <laughs> and that was caused from, from, you know, childhood. That was caused from sexual trauma and rape and things like that in um, childhood. And that's what so in a sense, that became my saving grace in a weird sort of twisted way of looking at it. But at the same time, I had no life. You know, everybody that had a, a way to siphon off life force off, you know, how the vampires, every vampire in town had, had their way with me. I was just their bitch, you know. And then, of course, it's all my fault. And then I would go punish myself for not being able to do well. But how could do well if they're all siphoning off all the all your energy so you can't even function and you know so there you were you know a host for the parasites to feed on and they are parasites now that's my testimony but it's the testimony of thousands of others who can't be here today that i mean that i knew personally maybe not that hundreds that i knew personally that can't be here today to tell you that once you're through that's it you're one of them that's it you have to feed once you once you're bitten you have to learn how to drink blood you know, metaphorically speaking. But the thing that really blew my mind more than anything else is how unrepentant they are about their murders, their sorceries, all the stuff they do. And then I find in Revelation 9, yep, the last verse in Revelation 9, they are unrepentant about their murders, sorceries, idolatries, you know, perversions, all of it. They're unrepentant. The Bible says they're going to be totally un. Don't waste your time because they're unrepentant. They want to burn in hell. They want to, They love death. They don't think anything about you know taking people out who are in the way. You know, like I said, nobody that uh, his life is worth billions of dollars, let alone millions. Look at Michael Jackson, definitely taken out. Uh, how much money they make after his death? Oh, billions. His life wasn't worth that. You know, it's sad but true. I mean, it's a sad reality we live in. So there, people's lives aren't even worth $5,000. And not even now, or even $1,000. In some countries, they're not worth $5. Bishop Kanko, again, going back to that interview a few years ago, that really kind of set it straight to understand this hierarchy and these you know, that, that there's another realm, another dimension where there's all these computers and all this technology and all this stuff where they're tracking every single soul on earth. They don't bother much with theirs, with their robots, because their souls they've already taken and sold in the open. There's like a market, you know. They've sold those souls and replaced them with the hive mind, you know, over soul mind thing. And that's really scary. When you see someone that's a human being and the next day they're, they're not a human being anymore, but they just do what they're... And then they function kind of as a human being, but there's really nobody there. I mean, there's there. There's a programmer there somewhere. And, you know, when we're talking about this, we're talking about most of your actors, actresses, you know, people in the, who are very successful are all falling into this category which is really scary. And then we pay to go watch them in the movie theater. We pay to, to download their music from iTunes. You don't download our music 
No, you do what you're told too. You're programmed to download their music. You know, they still have a grip and power on all of us. You're told to go watch, you know, okay, what you, the, if you, you can get some truth out of Mulholland Drive about uh, trigger words, satanic programming, the devil, the, the Satan, Hollywood, you know, it's in there. You have to glean it, but it's all in there. But you have to go to the approved of David Lynch to get that truth. You know, what about the independent filmmaker who's going to put it out literally that would be total truth? No, you don't go to him because you're not going to go look for him because you're not told it's any good. Someone has to tell you if it's good. So society, in a sense, is also then programmed. And the whole ship is sinking. And it's just, it's just a real mess. But when I came on the scene, I came up through the inside of this whole conundrum. And I, th I think because I'm very articulate about it, I'm able to articulate both spiritual and literal aspects. Um, it is, I guess they feel there's some sort of threat there. I... When I say they, I don't really even know who they are. I guess the people that are offended. I mean, when I say they, I have to include a guy that I thought was a, a mechanic at Lithia Dodge in Santa Fe. I thought they were, you know, okay. Turns out now they're criminals. Now, I can't prosecute because, I mean, what am I going to spend my whole life going after, you know, and what, I can't prove it either completely. You know, I mean, I have a witness that saw what happened, but then they'll say, well, how do you know that didn't happen somewhere else? You know what I mean? There's no, there's no way. There's no way. Even if you have evidence, there's no way. It's, 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 again, you got to go back to the Lord. You've got to go, you know, what battle should I choose to do and not do? You've got to go back to the Lord for direction, the Lord for going left, right, or straight. I'm telling you right now, I can't go left, right, or straight without the Lord telling me to do that. But that's, that's just the only way I can live after all this horror and trauma. Because I'm still, you know, I don't know what direction to go. I don't know who I am really outside him. You know, what would I do if I were a real person? I don't know. I don't know. that I, I don't know that I've ever been in like a person on earth with a goal of what? What are you going to do here? You know, who are you? What are we? How exactly are you going to have a, quote, life without God? There, I mean, what would you do? Okay, you go fornicate, you know, go work at a factory. I mean, what, do you, what is your life? Have a tailgate party? A few beers? Talk about sports? Fill your bellies, pass out, fall asleep from pleasure of all being filled with steak and potatoes and beer and football. And then go to Home Depot and, you know, do some kind of honeydew project. I mean, what is your life that, come on, that's not, a, if, if that's what my life was, I already have committed suicide. They are trying to, you know, um, just very interestingly regarding my daughter, she had a dream, you know, while in our presence that had to have come from, you know, high level witchcraft and stuff. And the dream was that she had seen her friends who were like hotties and, you know, mini skirts and sassy and had all the boys and, you know, you know what I mean. You know, they went through the other side and they're, you know, right in high school and they're, they're, they're the ruling class now, right? Anyway, and so that's all offered to her in this dream, you know, that she could have the desire, you know, she could be like them, you know, if that's what she wanted. And that's not what she wanted, but I'm saying that was just put right there on a platter. So, you know, that's happening because maybe she's in my presence, she's my daughter. So, you know, they're, so they're, they're attempting. I immediately bound it. We prayed and we bound that. We sent it back to send her, whoever sent it. But Satan was in the dream. Those chicks were in the dream. All that was happening. And she explained it to me perfectly. Uh, and I said, yeah, that's it. You know, those kind of things don't happen to me. Those kind of dreams. No, Satan's not interested.
I'd actually like to make one further conjecture. And I will call it a conjecture and not a prophetic statement, but it may be a prophetic statement. Satan cannot get God's own, no matter what they do. Even if they have you like the prodigal son for a while working in the, uh, the, the foreigner's pigsty or whatever, even if they get that, even if they can get it to that point, they still can't get you. You're still going to come home. Yeah, that's just the bottom line. God doesn't lose any of his. I knew I was God's child when I was, my first conscious understanding of that was when I was around four or five. Because despite all that was going on back then, he definitely protected me. Because the result of, you know, these, this, this system was that I got myself kicked out of the ritual, screaming and yelling because I became t- completely ashamed. I didn't want anyone to touch me or my body or any of it. So if anyone tried to do anything like that, I would kick and scream and yell and they couldn't keep me around. So, I mean, that's what, and it's been the same ever since. Ever since that point, it's been like that. Now I would say the guilt and shame is now beginning to subside at almost 58 years old. How many times it felt terribly awkward and, and social phobias and so forth and, you know, I had to go seek shelter, you know, go hang out alone, you know, try to unwind from the feeling of insecurity of people, you know, judging me, laughing at me, mocking me, you know, all that kind of feeling, you know, whether it was real or imagined, you know, completely sidelined me from life, you know, from, from being involved with people, from being, from going places and doing things because I was always ashamed. That was my programming. Shame, shame, shame. It's my fault. I ruined everything. I'm horrible. I'm a horrible person. Uh, you don't want me, I don't want to be around. They know I'm horrible. They know they're laughing at me. They're, I got to go hide somewhere. You know, that's basically the way, you know, it's been like that. You know, it even got so bad at one point when I was like, you know, around 20. Where if somebody would do something wrong, like even not even close, I, I would apologize for it. And, and, and in fact, I'm still doing that today a little bit. And that, you know, and that was the Satan's way, I believe, of of, of programming, of neutralizing me as a threat. Because if you feel guilt and shame, you really can't be a threat to the satanic kingdom. If you know what I mean, if you feel like everything is your fault and, you know, you're bad and you can't, you know, and then you're suicidal and, you know, you have no credibility because, you know, you've you've been in therapy that, you know, right there, you're neutralized. Who's going to believe you anyway? You're crazy. You just watch too many movies. You know, see what I mean? And then, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I'm just, you know, I'm just a loser. Why don't you like to be a winner? Like the old Communist Party thing, you know, you sign on with them. A lot of times people... What they'll do with the pure hearts, you know what I mean? There's there's pure purists in the Communist Party. Okay, those are the first ones to be shot in the back of the head. Those are the first ones to be. As soon as they get rid of the enemy, then they shoot them. They don't want pure hearts. They don't want pure true believers in communism in the Communist Party. Understand? They're the first ones to go. <laughs> so they're not welcome anywhere. But blessed be the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you understand? That's Sermon on the Mount. Blessed be the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Meaning, always in the presence of God. Always. And looking back on it, I've always been in the presence of God. Actually, there's never been a time I wasn't in the presence, because if I wasn't in the presence, I wouldn't be here. So, I owe it all to Him. I owe everything to Him. Why was I so rebellious where I would go on and on trying to solve it my own way? Because, you know, when you're younger, you're, you want to solve it. You want to do... I kept thinking I could have a life here on earth. You know, that there... 
you know, but after all the damage and all of, after everything that happened, there was no life available. But I mean, I have one now, you know, this is my life. But I mean, there was no life available because of all the events that happened that neutralized any possibility of having a life and also neutralized any possibility of being, say, one of them, the ubiquitous them, quote, quote, because um, they don't want pure hearts. Like, yeah, I'm really into Satanism. I really love it. I want to drink. But, you know, if you, you know, you go at it like that, like a zealot, they don't want you. That's not what they want. They want programmed slaves who, who don't think too much about spiritual things or even would deny the in, in existence of say that's what they want the people that are just don't even think about stuff like that that's the main the main bulk of them don't think in those terms the witches who control them do but they want obedient slave the men especially they don't want back talk from the men they don't want any sign of testosterone from the men unless it's testosterone used in the service of, of the witch who's running, you know, whatever principality. Because the witch is, you know, it's like a matriarchy on earth. I mean, a hidden matriarchy, an overt patriarchy, let's say Judeo-Christian patriarchy. But what runs that beneath the, behind the scenes is the, is the matriarchy. And they've always run things. Why would mothers like pedophilia? I, I don't think most mothers do. I just think that the ones who are running it are totally evil. I mean, is every woman a Jezebel? Absolutely not. But I can tell you the end game. You no, know, you'll never hear anything like this online, ever. The, the question to you, and especially to you uh, who are part of this problem, is how in the world are you going to not burn in hell for all eternity? That's what you should be thinking right now. You shouldn't be thinking about me in any way, shape, or form. Because all I am is a survivor of weak, despicable perverts. Beyond that, you know, and, and, you know, and also, you know, trauma-based abuse, which, you know, definitely messed my head up, messed my, destroyed my life, totally. You know, any possibility of having a life was wrecked by, I'd say, 15. Because there's a cost. Be, but that was my saving grace. You, do you see what I mean? That was why I'm a minister of the Lord. That was what saved me in the end. Get it? The thing that was the curse became the blessing. Wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't change a thing right now. I mention it all because there's many of you trapped in it who are blaming yourselves for something you didn't do. If you go back and look carefully at the events of your life, you'll see that much of what um, gets blamed on us a lot of times is some kind of a setup involving other people. You know, for example, take a suicide victim or someone who's on drugs. A lot of times that person self-medicating because of what other people have done to him or her. Or they've been traumatized somewhere in life they haven't dealt with, and it manifests in, you know, obesity, drugs, some kind of thing that's hampering them from going on in life. Um, you know, the, their motto is, you got to sign on with us and be obedient with us and work your way up the ranks, and then we'll give you a life. But nobody has their life on their own. And, of course, that's bullshit. Totally. You know, um, the Lord made this world and made all the plants and trees and made the planet and the sun, moon, the stars. And, you know, he made Satan to do what he's doing, which is to try souls. You're not here to have. Here's my point. You're not here to have a life. The only life you're going to have, you're here to find out who your maker is and serve that. You're not here to have a life. It's not about you. And once you get that, then you're free. Then you're free. It certainly isn't about me. My testimony, though, is 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 you know, and is um, real basic, you know. But it's it's real titillating in a way, you know, to to understand, um, you know, like from looking like a People magazine perspective or a gossip rag. But in general, 
we know that putting out pure information doesn't work. So I'm not interested in, you know, necessarily naming names or trying to affix blame to any one person here or there. Because I'm talking about a system that involves many, you know, all of, like in L.A., most of the people are caught up in it, you know. And all I can tell you is L.A. won't be there in the future. If the trend continues, it's over. And so is Washington, D.C., and so is the the United States. uh, God will not tolerate people in Satan. He will end that nation as he has every nation in the Bible. You just read about any nation, any group that, that condones the destruction of innocence, the destruction of children, that, that has secret pedophile networks, secret societies, oaths to evil, obelisks, idolatry, and all that kind of stuff. That nation is about done. So the people that sign on to all this obviously are vying for the destruction of their own nation and destroying their own households. You know, but then again, they're going to throw themselves in hell because how about a parent who sold their children out or even caused one to, to commit suicide or die or be killed, be, right? Because they were different or they, they didn't protect them. How do you think they're going to like standing there watching that on video in front of God and everybody else? How do you think they're going to enjoy that moment after death? Because I can tell you that that moment's coming for us all. Okay, how are they going to put up with that? No, when they see that, they'll say, "Turn it off." I'm just, I'll just throw myself in hell. <laughs> I don't want to see it. Now you can argue about what hell is and all that. You can even argue. Well, you don't really have a soul to throw into hell. You're just done. End. You didn't make it. You could have. But really, as Matthew 18, 6 says, you know, anyone who causes one of these little ones um, to not believe in me, basically, to turns them away from me, who otherwise would believe in me, says Jesus, be better than a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned at the bottom of the sea. That would actually be light, a light sentence for you. What's really going to happen uh, blows that away. Never, ever. Anyway, Satan, Hollywood, you know, the movies, the whole, you know, the whole culture we have here is is based on, you know, child indoctrination, child worship, pedophilia, the whole thing is. And you'll see they're going to try to make all that legal. Well, that's just a ruse to getting in their new world order. New world order, you know, children are to be, uh, you know, taught early on that they are to, to that they can get a, a pop in life if they serve this beast, if they serve the dragon. Those who learn early, five, six years old, they usually become the honchos of the society. You can't have a world. A world like that, like the Roman Empire, like all the empires of old, uh, you know, like, like Israel, will be destroyed. Plain and simple. See, here's the problem. I'm not going to argue that, you know, about... So if you want to go back and look at Greek literature, you'll see householder men having sex with 12-year-old boys. And it's considered completely normal. Okay. Um, the issue I'm talking about is violation, you know, trauma-based mind control, rape, you know, violence, um, ritual murder, involving children in murdering people in a ritual so that they get the, you know, that kind of, you know, the dark stuff. This kind of thing happens even in high school. For example, you get a group of kids who target someone. They commit suicide. You see what I mean? It becomes a sacrament. They're working in the system. It's already happening. They're already, their souls are already gone. If they don't accept Jesus Christ and repent, repent and accept Jesus Christ, what will happen to them is they won't have a soul or a heart or any mind left by the time they're 30. In other words, nobody home. They're just a zombie after that. That's it. When you see these mob mob stalking guys, these mobbers going into stores and looting, and a lot of times you see, you know, black kids from the ghetto doing it. But I mean, there's, you're going to see this on uh middle class, all kinds of age groups. They're not just kids either. 
you're dealing with people that have no mind and no soul at that point. People who are completely 100% lost. There's no justified revolution and good revolution. I mean, you're dealing with um, sycophants, clones, but, you know, people that are, um, they don't have idealism uh, toward, uh, uh, you know, their cause. They are just blind criminals at that point. They just go by day to day, thing to thing, whatever flies on their radar, they jump at it like a dog. Okay, so that's what people become. They just become animals, you know, untrustworthy, unstable, double minded, seared conscience, no soul, no mind ultimately, nobody home, empty shell program responses, and that's it. And if you remind them of that, they're offended, and then they never want to talk to you again. Anyway, but for me, I got to tell truth. Whether it's a, a family member, whether it's a friend, I have to tell the truth. If it means um, I get fired, I get docked, I get uh, uh, kicked out of, of uh, this or that, it doesn't matter. It, I owe everything to Yahweh, Elohim, Jah, God, Jesus. Without that, that's the one I need to please. He will not tolerate me buttering up um, people that could help my, quote, career, let's say, whatever that is. Um, people that, where I might benefit financially. Anything like that. Um, I have to treat it dispassionately and be about truth. And uh, it has meant probably, I don't know, who knows how much financial loss. I don't call it loss, I call it financial gain. You can't carry money with you. Further to that, I won't tell you things because I think you might donate to the ministry even if I need it. And, and you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to have to cancel this T1. I'm just telling you that. There's not enough funds there to justify it. Um, that means it's going to be real hard. I mean, I'm going to have to actually use like a wireless network to actually upload stuff, which, you know, like, like cell phone technology. Um, you know, I'm willing to do that. Uh, but, I mean, those that, that day is quickly coming. You know? But don't worry. You're approved of ministers. They'll all be online and they'll have tons of YouTubes and they can have all kinds of Bible teachings and boy, you'll be fine with them. Don't need me. Don't need me. <laughs> and even with that, see, what I'm saying is I can't butter you up to get you to, you know, kick in for the ministry. I can't do that. I've spent most of my time over the last 10 years pissing people off and getting them to withdraw their support. It seems like I've got some sort of death wish with money where I just want people to not support the ministry. So I, I but see, if I did anything other than that, God will hate me. I mean, not hate, but I mean, he'll, I'd be out of favor with, I can't, afford to do that I have to tell you the truth even if you get mad at me and then you you, know, you want to punish me you know there's a lot of people that got really blessed and there's a lot of people have been pulled out of the fire here a lot I mean a tremendous amount of people um, more more than any church I could th I mean you all well, church what does that do it puts them in the fire but you know a lot of souls to Christ you can't I can't capitalize on that A lot of people who are in elite circles also brought out. The reason they don't support the ministry is because they can't afford to have their name associated with it because they haven't yet come all the way out. They're not free yet. They don't want to be seen with me. Even though they know I'm right. And if they don't do what I'm talking about, they're going to be lost. If they do do what I'm talking about, they'll be free. They can run around. Wouldn't you like to run around and scream and yell and say whatever you want to people? I mean, you know, and of course, of course what I want to say is the truth. Don't you want to walk around and say the truth and just walk around like, I got the protection of Yahweh. I can say the truth anytime I like. I'm not going to be afraid of anybody. I'm going to go anywhere I want. 
Wouldn't you like to live like that? Rather than checking and rechecking and... You know, there's something about being like Gideon's army. The enemy's all over. But I mean, there's something also about being able to be a free spirit and not having worries because you know through your faith you have the protection of Yahweh. You'll go where you want. You'll say what you want. Thank you very much. It's his world, not yours. And uh, I'm not going to fear man. I'm not going to fear their sa satanic bullshit. I'm not going to fear their little system. I'm only going to fear the one that can cast my soul into hell. I'm not going to fear the guy that can, can just do away with my body. I'm going to fear the guy that can do away with my body and soul. Because that guy is stronger than the guy that can do the body, so he can actually protect the body if he wants me around. So, there, you know, the moment that I'm going to die has already been written in God's word. It's already been written in heaven. It's already been written in reality. So what good does worrying about that do? The, the thing with me is I've been so foolish. I've stuck my neck so far into satanic terror and gotten myself so close to being whacked I mean, so many times that at this point I need to boast about it. But I, mean to, I need to not be at that foolish. I'm not saying be a fool. Be wise as serpents and gentle as doves, you know. But at the same time, don't hide your light under the bushel basket. Go out to where they are and go to Las Vegas Strip and start preaching and go somewhere where the, where the, where the, where the battle is going on. Go to Hollywood. Go to Hollywood Boulevard. On the, on, you know, start preaching up a, a, a prophesying. I, I like to go prophesy to them out, uh, out there somewhere. That's what I want to do. And that's what I will do. Uh, people hate it when I prophesy. They hate it. Oh, they hate it. Because they don't want to hear the bad news. They don't want to hear, you know, that there's something wrong with them. They want me to lie to them. And they've told me if I start lying right now, doing the Jesus thing like they do, everything will be cool. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, we've we've got a, you know, big list of listeners and, a, you know, and it changes all the time. They come and go, but <clears throat> we have a lot and... Uh, a lot of them are very generous, you know, beyond generous, ridiculous generosity. Um, that is, uh, you know, and, and but they've all reported that in that they have also been blessed. So, you know, you do as led. So we've had tremendous, you know, I don't you know, mean to complain here. And I'm not. It's, it's just that uh, every once in a while, um, I just have to tell you that I'm going to say what I'm going to say. Regardless, if you support the ministry, you're going to hear, I don't care. If, if, you know, I'm not going to use that as a gauge. No, there's been times where it's been, you know, over the top. And then times where there's a dearth, you know, it goes, you know, it goes as it will. It's in God's hands. The point I'm making is I will not tell you stuff to get you to, you know, um, contribute. I will tell you things that will get you to not want to contribute. I will tell you things. I'll say the word bullshit that might offend you. If you, well, I'm not going to support that. Okay, that's not religious. Then go to where the, you have religion. And maybe they'll put up a building in your name, you know, if you give them enough money. No, my thing is about truth. I'm going to just keep saying it. And I've already, already alienated and pissed off enough people and completely uh in terms of literally i couldn't have done a better job had I, I i've gone up to the top of like a like, like like a skyscraper and just taken a bag full of money and dumped it out you know all over the place well you know, bless people but i'm saying i've done the equivalent of that with my mouth i don't think i'll be getting ahead like solomon you know, I mean, you know, there was a lot of wealth amassed in the kingdom, but I'm not going to be the king of Israel. When someone actually tells the truth and or prophesies or teaches truth or whatever, it's going to piss people off and they're going to reject you. And you just, there's, you need to rejoice in that. That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not going to, you know, I made, like I say, a career of repulsing people. I'm not going to start doing anything now to get friends because um, what I've learned, I'm just trying to impart to you what I've learned the last, especially this last period of time. 
I have learned that you cannot compromise at all. Not that I have, but I've learned to double down on truth, to double down on controversial statements, to double down. I mean, even to say it, even when it's inconvenient to say it, to double down on that. To embrace rejection all the more in service of truth and Jesus, Yahweh, God. Because the time is very short, friends. And, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't going to get it if you sugarcoat it. You know, there, there's not that much time for each soul to make their mind up what they're going to do. And like I say, there's a lot of zombies out there that don't have a soul anymore who are basically the walking dead now and there is no hope for them. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're corpses that are not in the grave, but there isn't anybody home to receive God, to repent, to receive, to, to be washed in the blood of Jesus. There's nobody there to be redeemed. This is something that people don't teach too often. They think, oh, everyone has a chance all the way till death. That's not true. Not everyone has a chance. There are a lot of people who've already gone the way of the second death and they are corpses and there is no point in preaching to them. They are done. And they're very dangerous and they will do harm to you because there's no reason for them not to do harm to you and you maybe you should just depart from their company. Especially in families. You know, you have a zombie there, maybe you have to depart from them. But put it this way, if they get mad at me and reject me, and if they're doing, they're rejecting God, who is speaking through me to them. That's what they're, they're not rejecting me. It's not about me. Remember not to take it personally. They're rejecting the Lord. They're not mad at me. They're mad at him. They're not mad at me. They're mad at themselves. Well, we certainly went on over two hours here, two hours and 11 minutes, folks. And I'm just getting warmed up. And with that, I bid you shalom, shalom. I love you and I'm praying for you. And now we're going to do, hey, we're going to pray the scriptures. I'm going to teach you all how to pray the Bible because that is the most powerful form of prayer you can do. I mean, it is the most anointed, powerful thing because you are, you are, you are coming into fellowship with all the angels and all the kingdom of God and your voice being added to it in prayer. And that's the only way to go. In Jesus' name, I pray for each and every one who is still conscious, who still has a heart, who still has a soul. Lord, Father, bless them with the truth and show them the way out. Show them the way also for those beleaguered souls who have been with you, Lord, but are suffering and are being picked on and rejected and strengthen them with the truth. Strengthen them to show them that your goodness Fill them with love. Let their cup runneth over. Let joy return to their hearts. Let them start smiling and laughing, Lord. Let them play as little children uh, because that delights you so much. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord. Amen. And I'll see you next time. Zeph Daniel, um, ZephDaniel.com, whatever, go there. There are many archives, many things to listen to, many different perspectives, a progression of my own spiritual walk, going back to almost a decade ago. And, and you can see how the Lord has blessed me over the years. It's actually tremendous. Uh, no worries about me and my testimony. I'm, I'm fully, not just good with it, I'm, I'm, today I am joyous, okay? I'm not, you know, looking back on it, it may be a little bit painful. My only regret, all right? My only regret, and this is the only thing troubling me today that's maybe putting a little not in my stomach, you know, is the fact that I was such a fool for so long. And that, you know, I just, God, I don't want to see any of you waste half your lives like I did. I was such a fool for so long. You know, and I had plenty of opportunity to come out. I had plenty of chance to be courageous. I was a coward, my friends. I was a coward. I was willing to accept being a third-rate citizen, you know, for what little favor they would give me, like a dog or a pet. Folks, I was not meant to be a dog or a pet. I was meant to be a man of God, a man of truth, a man of courage, a man of strength, a man of weakness, a man where God's strength is supreme. But, you know, I was meant to be fervent. I was meant to be joyous. I was meant to be passionate. 
You know what I was like? I mean, I hate to go back to a Walt Disney thing, but remember, if, if those of you, you know, who've seen uh, what the, the Sea Witch and the, um, what is it, the, the, the Little Mermaid. Well, there's a point there where this big, nasty sea witch takes Neptune and these other strong, you know, a very strong king of the sea guy, right? And makes him a little scared, little, no, don't hurt me, little, little weakling. Little pathetic weakling that everyone wants to kick around from a big, strong, big, strong, you know, king. And um, I, that's, you know, not that I'm a big, strong Neptune king. OK, but I mean, you know, that that I was kept in that little, you know, Neptune when he was a little little thing, you know, a little pathetic little thing, you know, at the beck and call of the sea witch. And it didn't have to be that way. All I had to do was speak truth, but I didn't have. Yeah, I was still rebelling against the Lord. I didn't you know, I wasn't serving him and you can't do it unless you got him. But that was my regret that. So many opportunities. Plus, you'd think after being poisoned, I would have understood that not to go back to people that poisoned me. And they're mad that I don't let them kill me. You know, I ruined everything because I don't let, you know, I mean, it's that kind of insanity. You know, I regret that I go back to old friends who tried to do me in and then I would try to get their approval of family and friends after what they've done. Like there's something wrong with me. Like I must have displeased you. I'm sorry. Will you like me now? Will you love me, please? And I kept going back for their love. When And, and, and I accepted that, oh, I'm the bad guy. When they're the criminal. You see what I mean? I was, I regret how much time that I had wasted trying to to love people in hopes they would love me back when all they would do was continue this game. And it's so powerful because I want to love so bad. You have no idea. I wanted love and approval because I never really got it. I wanted it. I'd, I would you know, even be a slave, even be a pathetic little wimp. And that makes me really pissed off at myself. <laughs> I mean, really, like, you know, thank God my daughter will never go through that. You know what I mean? She's, like, good to go right now. And I kind of envy her in a way, but in a way I don't because I don't, you know, life is so tenuous anyway, whether you're 21 or 48 or 58 or 13 or what. It's just, it's it's so amorphous. It's so, we don't even know how how to label it. You know, we don't even know what we're really dealing with here. And that's fine. But I just really regret all the years I spent trying to get approval of other people. I felt ashamed of myself and I wanted them to approve of me so that I could not, so I could not hurt myself. And so many times where I was blown out of a place or in shame had to leave and flee when it was them doing it, not me. And I would then blame myself and go back and go, I'm sorry, I guess I really flipped down. I'm sorry, I guess I drank too much. I'm sorry, I made a full, you know, I'm kind of screwed up. I'm going to go get therapy about it. Oh, yeah, you should get therapy. When it was them that did it, using their, you know, tricks and whatnot. When it was them that did, you know, that did, and I would, I had the exact opposite wrong view of myself. That was, that's the programming. Well, these people are despicable. I mean, I'll just tell you this. You cannot go back to murderers and criminals for approval and can't then call yourself the criminal and take the blame off them and put it on yourself and be a whipping boy and think that they're ever going to respect you or approve of you. I didn't do it consciously. It, it Look, my redeeming factor here is that I just wanted love. You know, I needed love. Now, I'm not going to feel guilty for seeking love. But the Lord was right there the whole time, just waiting for me to seek him for love when because the others failed. And then, friends, not only did they not love me, they don't love each other and they don't love themselves. 
they're just filled with darkness and hatred and all they want to do is strike out. They win the game. It's all about money. You know, they want to play the money game and they be, their hearts are dark. They don't have any capacity to love. But I kept going back to them, wanting them to say, you're one of us. And wrap their arm around me and say, welcome. And as a fool, I did the same thing a billion times with the same result, hoping for a different result. And, you know, what a fool believes he sees. And I, a fool, believed. I believed that this time it would be different. This time it would be different. This time it would be different. This time it's going to be different. I'm going to try a lot harder. I'm going to do everything I can to succeed this time. That's how much time I, how much pain that was how unnecessary it was and now how foolish it seems looking back on it i wow if this podcast in any way can help you not have that kind of thing going on then i think you have just gotten a million dollar check to put it in you know far more valuable than money in other words then you have a lesson you have freedom you can walk out right now 25 year old and you can you just understand the way it is and you know you're never going to be caught up in that again. You're going to be set free here. You're set free. I'm set free now. I have no complaints. You know, I, I'm just mad at myself. Yeah, I knew better. And I couldn't, I, you can't serve God and be trying to please them. You know what I mean? You'd, I knew better. I knew better. And then when they did stuff, it's like, yeah, well, what part of, uh, you know, sleeping with scorpions don't you understand? They're going to sting you because they're scorpions. Get it, dummy? I mean, that's how I feel. You know, it's like, well, what did you think it was going to be? You're going to put poisonous vipers in your bed and, and expect them not to bite you and be polite? And I... I guess I was just a hurt child wanting... because I blame myself for everyone's pain. I thought that, you know, if I could just try to be a better person, then they would love me. Why don't they love me? You know, and that whole struggle, you know, you under I know you, you understand, but see, hearing it from me, it's really ready. Don't cry. Just forget it. Just pray. Just seek the Lord. But, but crying is not going to help. You know, I know this is overwhelming for some of you, but it's, it's, it's not going to help. It's, you know, learn. That's going to be better than crying. Crying, I'm telling you, if we all start crying right now, we would not stop for the next thousand years. Forget about it. It's not your fault. It's their fault. You know, they were the ones that did it to you. You know, the, you know, you didn't do it to them. You know, you're innocent of that. They tried to blame you. You know, black sheep, this misfit. You know, you caused your father grief. You caused your mother grief. You didn't. It's it's not your fault. That's the point. And you didn't do that. They they just that's what weak people do is look for other people to blame for their own unhappiness because their system didn't you know, deliver what it was supposed to when they sold their soul. So they, they didn't get the million dollar ring. They didn't get the, uh, you know, Academy Award, you know, whatever. And they're mad and they're crazy and they're psycho. And you're not. So l they're the ones who should be crying, not you. If you, hey, if you need to cry, if it makes you feel better, go ahead. But I have learned, I've cried a rivers in the past and it's, you know, it might be cathartic, but all I know is it just ends up making me really tired, you know. So I kind of, you know, I save the tears for when it's, you know, when it's really natural and beautiful and lovely. Um, not when it's over past whatever's, because there is no past. Understand, there's only I am. I've gone and talked to you now a lot longer, and I'll see you next time.